Um, I'm really happy to be here because I think what I did in my PhD research quite nicely links to the questions that have been raised for this workshop. And um, I have to make uh, one note to my current employee because since yesterday I'm not working in Berlin anymore, but at the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research. I'm sorry I didn't say that. <laughs> And um, my today's talk um, has the title From Concept to Configurations. And um, this is because my message today will be that we should not focus so much on the concepts like, <laughs> concepts like smart cities, but rather on the configurations like the actual sites uh, where lighting technology is applied. And um, yeah, you will, you will find more on that in my later case study. So to just give you a brief impression of the next 20 minutes, um, today I will first talk about my perspective, like my conceptual or my, my um, programmatic view for today on, on the concept of smart lighting and, and then exp like give you an impression what I mean by configurations. Then I will give you a, just a very brief introduction um, to, to make you understand my methodology and for those who are not interested in research, you can just lean back and ignore it. Um, <laughs> but please come back and wake up again when I come back to my case studies and one is on failure and one is on, on success, so I think we have a nice variety here uh, on what a lighting, in a, a light, a lighting, LED lighting project in the city uh, could turn into. And then I will um, also present like the general findings of my uh, thesis uh, that was finished last year, so this is maybe also worth one note. Um, my, my research, my um, ethnographic research was done in 2011 to 2012. So I'm not presenting you um, the, the latest uh, smart technology experiences that we might find today in cities. Um, and I will end with a conclusion uh, which sums up my general claim. And uh, my general claim, or like my, my thesis for today, um, kind of addresses this concept of smart cities. I, I want to consider it as a concept today because um, I think it has as yet to be proven in, in reality and has to be fleshed out in, in urban situations what a smart city actually means. And um, you, you all know that like the, the concept of smart cities is closely linked to the Internet of Things, like uh, lighting technology, but also other urban technologies and infrastructure, uh, infrastructures communicating with each other. And as you can nicely see in this F Philips uh, image, the Philips people might recognize it, um, it also raises questions as uh, with regard to who is actually controlling this new lighting situations, who is actually controlling what is going on in our cities uh, in a digitalized future. And um, I mean, this image also um, addresses this topic of what are the skills needed to control these lighting technologies. Um, and it seems as if like blue collar uh, lighting maintenance work will be more and more replaced by uh, um, desk jobs. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> but uh, this also raises the more social question, namely who's actually going to leave the office to go outside and talk to the people in, the, in, in urban environments and in real situations. Um, I found in my research that um, it, it makes a difference if um, political decision makers or municipal decision makers have um, a close connection to the people on site and if they have to go there from time to time to talk to the people in the streets because they do get some feedback even though they do not make a great survey or something, they, they still have some impressions uh, of what is going on in streets and so I, I also think that having the technology doing the job for you might <laughs> might change this configuration as well. So this brings me to um, my general observations about the concept of smart cities. Um, my observation is that smart cities are sold as more efficient. However, their actual chance and challenge is that they can offer more appropriate solutions. And um, this brings me to my, my claim or thesis that a key evaluative principle in urban planning is actually changing at the moment. Maybe we cannot see it in, in every respect yet, but I will give you some, uh, uh, well, I, I will try to substantiate this claim later on. And this claim is, in other words, that in smart cities, the notion of appropriateness is replacing the efficiency paradigm of the industrial city. Like the city where gas infrastructures, where electricity infrastructures 
uh, created uh, the benefits of economies of scale for, for lighting as well. I mean, if you think of the pre-industrial times, they, you had to light candles in oil lamps in order to have uh, city lights, and it was extremely expensive to have five <laughs> or 10,000 more light points. With the industrialization, this really changed, and you had a pipe, uh, pipeline or an electricity grid, and it made more sense to light the whole city rather than just parts of it. And I think this efficiency paradigm um, is probably not the most important aspect why we now want to digitalize our lighting. And um, well, as I said, to substantiate my claim, I will now come to the configurations. And these configurations are situated in um, Berlin and Lyon, because this is where I did my ethnographic research, as I said, in 2011 to 2012. Um, I visited both cities. Well, in Berlin, that was easy because I lived there. And um, as you can see in the, in the pictures, like this is Berlin, and on the right-hand side is Lyon. Um, or maybe you cannot see it, but these two cities are very different. Lyon is uh, much smaller than Berlin. S Berlin has like inhabits three million inhabitants, more or less, and Lyon, Lyon only 500,000. However, Lyon has many more people working in municipal public lighting. Um, there's a department of 100 people, and they also do the maintenance, whereas in Berlin, we have a very different uh, setup with um, only seven people working at the Senate administration level for public lighting of the whole huge city. And then you have the districts with their lights responsibles and, and then also a, lo a lot of uh, contractors, private contractors and uh, a private light manager and then a lot of subcontractors. And um, when you look at uh, specific projects like LED projects in these cities as I did, these are the dark gray spots here. And um, you use the methodology that I used, which is called situation an analysis. You can find that if you look very specifically, the people involved in these projects, they will raise different issues and aspects. They will address problems, very specific, site-specific problems, but also um, transnational <laughs> problems or EU uh, um, standards or um, for example, um, global discourses like the, the discourse on, uh, on light pollution, for example, in order to justify their decisions, in order to, to make their de decisions and to, to have a good foundations for um, delivering good lighting uh, for, for their city. And um, so I thought the beauty of looking at specific configurations was that you can see what actually matters in these configurations. It's not conceptual at all. It's, it's really, you go there, you talk to the people, and, and then you, you will see what they actually address and what actually moves them and makes them take their decisions. Um, ha. So this are, these are a few impressions from my research uh, uh, routine or daily life. Uh, on, the, on the top you can see like a focus group, like an expert workshop I did in 2010 with some Lucy people of the Latin Urban Community International. You see Alexandre Colombardi, and you also see Isabel Cotton, who many of you probably know. And um, uh, there are also researchers and, and other lighting designers. And so I, I talked to them, and I also went to the lighting building to, s to have some, some idea of the new technological developments. I went to the construction sites, and I took many, many notes. And uh, I did some uh, coding with these many, many notes, and I also did document analysis, so that means I read all the Lyon light plans, and, um, and the qualitative coding. That means uh, what I'm telling you now are rather uh, qualitative insights, like stories um, and like in-depth analysis. It's not like that I counted things and that I um, can give you a general and validated overall impression of what matters, but it's really um, case-specific, and, and from there you can extrapolate maybe some more general um, ideas about how things work in the world of lighting. So these are my six case studies, like six different LED projects, three in Lyon on the top and three in Berlin. And today I will shed some light on only two of them. Um, they are quite comparable in the sense that they both were um, installed in very central spaces or in quite central spaces of the two cities. Um, the upper picture shows the Place Belcourt in, uh, in Lyon, which is in the center of the city and supposed to be the uh, largest uh, European pedestrian square. 
And um, the, the lower picture is um, a, a street close to Bahnhof Zoo in Berlin. And um, there w especially in the, in the Berlin case, there was a, a rationale behind this because they, wa they chose this specific site in order to display their early LED experiments um, or LED displays uh, in Berlin. And as I will show you in a moment, this, this idea of having a public display failed, <laughs> unfortunately. And um, in fact, this is what I'm referring to when I say urban governance or socio-material urban governance, because I think it's quite interesting how urban actors choose um, sites for technological developments or technological tests or displays in their city in order to also manage uh, public audiences or public attention um, to what they do in cities. But this is only a side remark. So the case study in Berlin. This is uh, Leibnizstraße, and uh, when I wrote this up or thought about it more thoroughly, it occurred to me, and maybe this was my theater studies background, that it has the structure, this case story has the structure of a Greek tragedy. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it starts with an introduction, and then you have this climax, and after that everything goes down, tragic downfall, but then there's a little turning point, and then like everything goes down again. <laughs> And so what happened was that, um, in short, the, 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 the story, uh, the, the project was meant as a demonstration project, but it turned out as a public trial for the actors involved, especially the municipal actors who pushed it. So um, the project started in, in about 2009, when the municipality realized, hey, there's LED technology. This is really smart and cool, and we want to show as the biggest um, manager of lighting technology in, in, in Germany, we want to show that we have LED technology and we know how to handle it. And um, so they, they really had high hopes with this new uh, technology, so they teamed up with the technical university for technical advice and they went to the lighting building and they found their trusted manufacturer and they um, chose an LED product which was Side note, at the time already outdated because the internal processes in Berlin take so long to uh, get the funding and so on <laughs> that, <laughs> uh, yeah, that by the time they had procured the product, it was already a little bit outdated. Anyway, there was still high hopes. So they were all um, planning up to the inauguration event. And when the night came, they just turned off the, uh, on the lights and there was a big uh, outcry, wow, there's Claire, we don't like it. So the, the, the experts was really were really not um, very convinced. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit here. Um, so the experts were kind of um, criticizing the, the glare. And, and this was due to the fact that um, um, the installation was um, over, um, how do you say, um, oversized in a way. Like there was too much power in the installation for to in order to, to um, manage the, the degrading LED technology in the future. So they put it on to 100% in the inauguration night, and later they just dimmed it down to 60%. Um, so now it's perfect. And it also lights the street much better than the technology that used to be there before. Nevertheless, it is still perceived like the, the, the um, municipal actors still thought that um, it was not such, a, not such a great inauguration night. And um, they still had a little bit hope uh, with regard to energy efficiency and um, cost savings. However, even this hope was um, uh, we ca came to an end when the um, private uh, energy supplier finally said that, no, we are not going to, um, to account for these energy savings with the 60% um, LED, uh, LED lighting because we, are only, we can only account for the um, installed uh, wattage. So um, we, d we don't have uh, <laughs> we don't have measurement devices, calibrated measurement devices on every light pole. So sorry, guys. Um, the the installed uh, electric the load is is the basis for our calculations, and you have to pay 100 percent. So this got really a problem in order uh, in, in terms of justifying the the cost of the installation. And another disappointment was that. Um, the private uh, light manager um, also had not such a big interest in working with this new digital control program. I mean, this was in English and it was also just this one street, so the, the overall <laughs> management uh, benefits were also blown in the wind. Um, and as a, as a result, the municipal actors perceived this project, at least they did so in my interviews, 
as a as a failure and like a general failure and and they were really disappointed because they put so much effort into it and um ever since then at least to my knowledge uh, there haven't been any other um, experiments with uh, digital or intelligent lighting in berlin so this brings me to my Lyon uh, contrasting case the place belcourt you can see it in the middle it's this uh, uh, square lit in, in white light and um, there was this problem with uh, really outdated lighting technology and this added oops and yeah uh, lighting technology and um, no, and now they have installed um, really new LEDs and um, when we compare this and, and if, we if we stick with the theater metaphor <laughs> you could say this is uh, an example of post-traumatic theater <laughs> because there, there was no drama at all in this project uh, maybe there was but before and it was not so much related to lighting because it started as an urban regeneration project back in 1989 <laughs> and it took a very very long time until everything was kind of at the point where they, um, where they did something with the lighting and, um, and called in a light planner to join the team, the planning team, the landscape architect. And then there was another stagnation because of um, yeah, some, some political problems and also there was a parking lot under, under, under the square and the concession for the parking space uh, for this underground parking is longer than the, the, the light works and so on and so there, there were some worries that if they did some technical work underground they might um, affect the, the parking and this might lead to um, money problems or like money claims and um, so there were stagnations but then <laughs> LED technology was finally mature enough to be considered by the light planners. Um, so they came up with um, two or three different light solutions. So first, no, two. There was one with um, some with some re reflector technology involved, and another one with LEDs. And they presented it to, to the municipality, and the municipality is quite cautious with new technology, especially if they do that in the main square of Lyon, uh, because as you know, Lyon is quite famous for its lighting, and um, it would be a, a shame when when they installed um, a technology in their main square which doesn't work. The press would jump on that immediately. So they were like, "Whoa, wait! <laughs> we need to know more about LED technology first. However, the um, the architects, the the, the Monument uh, Protection Associ Association of France, that which was also involved in the project because it's such a big square and it's a um, monument uh, protected site. Um, these architects, uh, the Bâtiments de France, they really liked the LED solution because it was very elegant. So they pushed for it. A very interesting constellation, not the technicians, but the, the architects pus pushed for the LED. And um, so finally, the lighting designers came up with a mock-up, which is another little <laughs> highlight in the story. And um, in the, during this mock-up night, when they put on different LED uh, um, lighting solutions, um, the, the municipal planners were finally convinced that LEDs were great because they were the only solution that uh, managed to really light up the whole square quite homogeneously. All the other um, lighting technologies had to be turned up much more and they would still not light the center. But with LEDs with um, a specific, um, with a specific um, um, uh, lens, or yeah, um, yeah, uh, um, um, a fracturing lens. They could they could actually manage to to distribute the light quite homogeneously. Um, and then there there were some some issues or some some worries about um, uh, about warranty issues or how how long would the LED technology actually last. So there were some ne negotiations also with the manufacturer who gave the uh, city finally a, a warranty of ten years. And they also um, built in a lot of um, overvoltage protection devices because the electri electricity grid underneath the square is really old and due to the parking it could not be replaced. And um, so this was also a major concern to be worried about that what happens if, the, if the, the, the old infrastructure is not compatible with the new technology. So in the end the, the project was uh, finalized and the LEDs are dimmed every night um, around 11 or midnight uh, to I think 50 percent and the population doesn't realize that there's any dimming involved because the 
square squared homogeneous unit and as you might know or as you probably know the, eye, the human eye does not perceive these 50 percent um, um, dimming but only much much more dimming so in the end the, the population of Lyon was happy with the installation so at least they did not complain and um, the project is uh, was applauded by uh, many uh, visitors and expert groups who came to see uh, uh, Lyon lighting during the Fête de Lumière and uh, uh, as far as I know from the manufacturers and the light plants involved, other cities have now asked for the same LED solutions. So uh, my conclusion from these two cases is that the Berlin case uh, was efficient but an inappropriate solution for this specific situation and inappropriate in many respects. Uh, inappropriate in uh, with regard to the infrastructure because there were no uh, calibrated measuring devices on every light point, inappropriate with regard to the organizational setup because the light manager was not happy to use the program, um, and inefficient with regard to the public response um, at first. The Leon case, on the contrary, was equally efficient uh, and the dimming worked really well, but it was also an appropriate solution in many other res respects, as I have said. Um, they they um, thought of all the infrastructural adjustments that had to be made and um, they, they involved all stakeholders um, at a point where, where they could still make the changes. So finally this was um, a highly um, recognized and also um, nice pro uh, project. Um, so now I come to my general findings like taking all these six case studies together. Um, I found that um, there's not just one size that fits all when we look at LED technology. And um, as I have said, these two cities are very different. Mm -hmm. And so as I have also already said, Lyon is uh, known as the city of light. So there's this light festival and there's an expert audience um, of light professionals that come to the place regularly and, and um, take part in, uh, like from, from the outside, take part in what's going on there in terms of innovation. Um, on the contrary, Berlin is known as a dark gazopolis, <laughs> one could say. Well, it's known as a dark place in the lighting world because there are, it's true, there are very few light points like compared to uh, like in, on, a, on an average level. And um, above all, there's also like really outdated technology still around in Berlin, including gas lighting. And there's also a big community uh, of citizens who are fighting for the preservation of these gas lights even though they do not um, illuminate the city on a very high level. And um, it is an um, explicit um, p policy of the, um, of the urban lighting and also um, city planning department to keep Berlin dark. This is not only for efficiency reasons, but also as in terms of cultural heritage or as a, in order to preserve the, the urban image. So um, what I found was that when I looked at all the LED projects in Lyon and all the LED projects uh, in Berlin at the time, we can see that Lyon is uh, um, installing cutting edge LED technology. They're trying to keep up with technological developments. Um, and in, in Berlin, they're really trying to preserve the, the urban image and they, they bend and twist <laughs> LED technology in order to make that happen. So, they have come up with a very innovative LED solution that mimics gas light, <laughs> which you can see on the right hand side. And um, it is much more expensive than another uh, electricity replacement of gas light, but um, it, um, it does not stir the, the public concern and, and attention of, um, of the, the gas light um, friends and the crowd that is protecting the Berlin cultural gas light heritage. And um, so this is how it looks on site. Well, this is an LED gas light <laughs> and um, they, they have even gone so far to, to keep the, um, the iron cast uh, pillars with a water jet beam technology. So they're just uh, cutting open the, the, the pillars and they put in the electricity and then they, so they, they can say that they even save energy with, with that. And this is um, a stairway in, uh, in Lyon where they have installed another Philips product. <laughs> And um, which is also yeah, quite, uh, qu quite nicely adapted to this specific location. Um, so my conclusion is, um, can we talk, uh, can, we, can we actually 
say that there's a new paradigm maybe in, um, in lighting or when we, when we look at the smart city? Um, well, obviously there are two answers. One would be not at all. We are reconfiguring the industrial city with different means. Um, but the second answer would be that, yes, indeed, there is a new paradigm and appropriateness justifies smart solutions more than um, the, the e efficiency paradigm. So some pros for the not at all answer is that efficiency remains, remains the key argument in planning. Um, infrastructures are developed in past dependent ways. So in many cases we find that municipalities are not willing to change too much because of course it costs uh, incredibly a uh, lot of money. And in many, uh, in, in many situations we also find that Standards are designed for efficient solutions in a very general way, but I think there's a danger because, um, I mean, we all remember the car-friendly city. That was also a, a concept <laughs> that was um, like linked to a, to a technology, a mobility technology, and it ended with some general solutions for many cities all over the world. But I think what we should actually do is rather look, as I said, look at the actual situations and configurations and see how, how the appropriate standards could be made. So, of course, I'm, I'm a little bit biased here. So, uh, if, I'm, if I'm giving the yes indeed answer, uh, then I think my evidence is that I have seen a, a lot of customized site-specific lighting solutions and um, I've also seen that they are mostly more successful because they... Um, yeah, because, because they, um, uh, they incorporate the interests of more stakeholders than the only efficient solutions. And technological solutions are shaped city-specifically. I've also seen that, which, which I've tried to, uh, to show you with the two different LED uh, configurations. And finally, city-specific needs and local stakeholder matter. And I think... Um, you can best uh, you can see that uh, best when you look at Lyon and, and Berlin, and you see that in Lyon you have these expert audiences that come to the city regularly for Lucy meetings, but also for the Fête de Lumière. And um, the Lyon lighting engineers they complain that um, the population, or they they say that the population doesn't doesn't show too much interest in in lighting in general. Um, on the other hand, if you look at Berlin, you have a very different audience, like audience of public lighting. Um, this audience is made of citizens and these citizens are quite uh, cautious and, and quite attentive uh, with regard to what the city is doing with their lights. And uh, so I think if we think about new lighting and lighting, new lighting technologies, we should bear in mind that even, even the, the observers of innovation and, uh, and the stakeholders differ from, from place to place. So that was my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. and.